Well, uh, hello everyone. I am pleased to welcome you this evening to this live event on Seminary Now. Um, if you're not familiar with Seminary Now, it's a uh, streaming video platform that is uh, delivering Bible and theology and ministry courses from a diverse group of authors and, uh, and scholars. And so uh, I'm Paul Caminiti. I'm a co-founder of the Institute for Bible Reading. We're a action-oriented think tank working to change the way the world reads the Bible. And I'm delighted to um, be able to introduce to you and then interview um, our teacher for this evening, who is Dr. Tremper Longman. And uh, I think many of you are familiar with uh, with Tremper and uh, and his work. Uh, he's currently the Distinguished Scholar of Biblical Studies at Westmont College in uh, Santa Barbara, California, where he spent the lion's share of his career. Also a visiting professor at uh, the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology, adjunct professor at Fuller, um, speaks at Regents College, I could go on and on, and uh, we would we would use up the the whole evening. But um, uh, Trevor it, or Tremper, excuse me, Tremper is a um, co-authored over thirty five books, both popular and uh, academic. And the one that we're going to focus on um, is a book that uh, Tremper wrote back in I think it was two thousand thirteen, Old Testament Essentials: Creation, Conquest, Exile. And return, and of course, that uh, was an IVP book that won the Reader's Choice Awards. Um, Dr. Longman is also a linguist and a member of the New Living Translation Translation Committee and on the board of Biologos and others. So, anyhow, welcome um, to you, Tremper. Good to be uh, with you tonight, and really looking forward to this conversation. Thank you, Paul, and it's great to be with you and to be hosted by Seminary Now, which I think presents so many great courses online from many of my good friends and people I deeply respect. Yeah, for sure. And um, before before we dive in, there's a couple of uh, giveaway opportunities. Um, one is for a free copy of Old Ten. Old Testament Essentials, um, but also we'd like this evening to give away a one-year subscription, free subscription to Seminary Now, and to enter into that, you simply need to share uh, this live stream on Facebook, and uh, we have your names, and we'll draw a winner, and you have 24 hours um, after the event to be counted uh, for the drawing. And then second, just by simply you know, um, signing up to view Tremper's course and uh, others at Seminary Now, we would like, Seminary Now would like to give anyone who does that a free um, seven, day, seven day trial. So um, just one or two housekeeping things. Uh, there's an opportunity for you to post um, questions for Tremper in uh, in the chat box anytime during the event, and um, even as we're we're getting started now, um, would you uh, put in that comment section um, where you're from? We'd like to see how many people are with us, and uh, from what part of the country or the world you're in. So uh, please do that now. Um, here's a quick. Two minute uh, trailer of uh, Tremper's uh, Seminary Now course, and then I have some questions for you, Tremper. All right. Thanks, Paul. I'm perfectly aware and understand on one level why many Christians spend most, if not all, of their time studying the New Testament. The need to understand the Old Testament in order to truly understand the New Testament. The Old Testament is not just some old dusty book filled with ancient stories, but rather it's a door through which we can walk in order to know God more deeply. 
also learn how God wants us to live in a way that allows us to flourish. We should also remember that the Old Testament was the Bible to Jesus, the disciples, and to Paul. If you haven't studied the Old Testament much before, take this opportunity to learn what the message of the Old Testament is. I'm Trevor Longman, and I'd love to invite you into a journey to study the Old Testament. Good. Trumper, uh, I'd love to begin with your personal story. Um, how, how did you get hooked on the Bible? Not everybody gets hooked on the Bible, right? And then uh, maybe kind of as a follow-up to that, uh, how did you get hooked on the Old Testament? Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, so I became a Christian uh, at the end of my high school uh, career probably around 1970, uh, my last year as a high schooler and um, during the Jesus Revolution days. And I went off to Ohio Wesleyan University and uh, other people were becoming Christians and we were excited about Jesus and about the Bible. But I think where I really got hooked was when I started attending uh, religious studies classes, thinking I'd learn more about the Bible, and indeed I did, but there were some challenges in taking those classes, and it really motivated me to really dig deep into scripture, and uh, and I, I uh, really got hooked on the Bible as a whole then. Now, I got particularly interested in the Old Testament when I went off to seminary. And I uh, I went to seminary thinking that I'd probably want to go into an academic career if God uh, gave me the gifts and the grades that I needed to get into graduate school. And uh, But I wasn't sure what area I'd go in. And I came, uh, I, I, took classes from a very, at that time, young scholar named Raymond Dillard. And mm. uh, Ray was just such a exciting teacher. He was in love with the Bible. He was in love with the Old Testament and it was infectious. And uh, I uh, decided to go into that area, partly because of that excitement that he uh imparted to me, but also because I knew even then that Christians struggled with the Old Testament, and there weren't a lot of resources like there are today in um, uh, the mid-70s. So I was excited to go off to Yale University to study, get my PhD in ancient Near Eastern studies, and then Ray was able to hire me back uh, to Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia, where I started my career for uh, the first 18 years. And so um, I, I went into Old Testament studies out of my own curiosity and interest and passion, but also because I, I knew that people struggled, Christians struggled with the Old Testament. And I wanted to provide resources and help to um, to encourage Christians to discover the richness of the Old Testament. That's excellent. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to talk about that in a few minutes, about the challenges of reading um, the Old Testament or the First Testament. Maybe that's part of the problem is that we call it old, right? Right out of the yeah, chute. Yeah. You know, the, the mothball version of the Bible. But... Um, but but before we do that, I, I I'd like to kind of set this up because it, it seems to me that we have slipped into an era where people are not only confessing that the Old Testament has been hard to read, but it's come under some criticism um, yeah. recently, and um, you know there are people that are saying boy, you know, the Old Testament is actually a detriment 
to our story. Um, you know, some have said it's kind of fodder for the atheists. Uh, God, you know, is portrayed as pro-slavery, you know, anti-women, pro-violence. And then, you know, there's even some language, Tremper, that is surfaced about uncoupling Mm, the mm. uh the old testament as though we've got a train right and right. and the caboose or whatever is is just dragging us down and um you know the whole idea being that you know maybe the the story is a better story without it or at least it's easier to tell <laughs> and maybe easier to defend and so we have people that have identified themselves as you know, red letter Christians, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Leviticus and Numbers have been the death knell of people trying to read, you know, through the whole Bible. So what to, what would you say <laughs> to well, <laughs> people who were saying we'd be better off uncoupling the Old Testament? Yeah, so there's a lot to say, right, Paul? And the first is simply that as Christians, we can't uncouple from the Old Testament. Um, the Old Testament is 77% of God's word. It's Jesus' scriptures, which he fully embraces. Jesus himself in Luke 24 says that the whole uh, scriptures, by which he means Old Testament, First Testament, uh, talk about his coming. Uh, the <laughs> I sometimes tell people that... Um, I, I make an analogy with the way my father used to take me to the movies when I was young. You know, I, I don't know why he did this, but he never checked when the movie started. He'd just say, let's go to the movies. We'd show up. And I remember going to one James Bond movie and there was 20 minutes left in the movie. And it was really, really exciting, but I had no idea what was going on. And uh, that's kind of like, reading well we'd stay through the intermission then we'd watch the movie again at the beginning and then when we came to the place where we come in he'd say okay this is where we came in we're gonna leave so you really can't understand the old testament uh, the new testament without the old testament i just read a i just wrote a commentary on revelation mm -hmm. in a series called uh revelation through old testament eyes and every single verse is dripping with old testament illusions. And yeah, yeah, there are issues uh, for sure that we struggle with in the Old Testament, but I would submit to you that those issues are there in the New Testament. Uh, mm -hmm. You really have to have a very narrow canon to avoid them. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why back around 200 AD, when a guy named Marcion had similar ideas that we didn't need the Old Testament, he eventually started chopping off large parts of the New Testament, including the book of Revelation. So you don't avoid the issue of divine violence by abandoning the Old Testament and just going to the New Testament, nor do you have a broader, say, sexual ethic presented in the New Testament than you do in the Old Testament, nor do you... Uh, you know, avoid issues connected with slavery and patriarchy mm. uh, in the New Testament either. Though I, I think one of the problems that we have on the issues of patriarchy, polygamy, uh, mm. slavery is that we don't understand that sometimes God takes us where, takes the people of God where they are and moves them toward the creation ideal and that even the New Testament ethic, which does not prohibit slavery, doesn't prohibit polygamy, is patriarchal. We have the theological uh, substance in all of scripture, especially if we look back at Genesis 1 and 2 as to how God created us uh, to move toward those creation ideals of the abolition of slavery, uh, support for gender equality, uh, monogamy, not polygamy. So, um, so I guess that's a long answer to your question, but it's a, it's a big issue these days. You're right. I hear it a lot, but, um, but 
those who want to uncouple or unhitch from the Old Testament uh, are really, I think in one sense, trying to create a God that they want to worship rather than reading the Bible to understand the God that they do worship. Yeah, And I understand, by the way, we aren't mentioning his name, but um, the person who's said we should unhitch ourselves from the Old <laughs> Testament, as I understand it, didn't really mean it that way. Well, if that's the case, he needs to be out there yelling it from the rooftops that he didn't mean it that way. So, yeah, uh, yeah. I, so I think we'll leave that person nameless, but but I, I do think that it was taken out of context. Yeah, in, yeah, but he needs to, he needs to be working really hard to put it. Yeah, in yeah, and I and I think he 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 did. He subjected himself yeah. to yeah. many yeah. many podcasts, and I I think, yeah, good, I think good, straightened good. Um, straightened out people's you know mis misunderstanding. Good, good, good. But you're you know you're really right. Um, if if you're wanting to escape controversy. Um, you're going to find it in the New Testament too. And for those that say, well, I, you know, frankly, I'm just happy with the words of Jesus. Well, there's, there's a little controversy there too, right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, it can sound at times very binary, you know, yeah. here's this parable and, you know, the, the, the fish get swept up in the nets and yeah. the, good, the good ones go here and the bad ones go there, you know? And, yeah. Yeah. Um, that doesn't sound like Jesus that spoke to, you know, the woman taken in adultery when he says, you know, where your, where your, um, you know, accusers, um, I, I don't, I don't condemn you. I don't accuse you. So which, right. which, which of those, so all that to say that, that, um, the challenge of scripture, which is, yeah. I think one of its delights and what Augustine said kept, keeps us coming back and keeps us from being bored it's it's in every segment right not yeah. just yeah. so okay absolutely okay so um you know here what in the next 15 minutes we're going to cover the whole um <laughs> old testament which is i think you said in your presentation it's like 77 percent of the entire bible you do 18 um sessions most of them somewhere between i think 10 and 15 minutes um, you know, we, we wouldn't give up the Old Testament, if nothing else, because of those dozen or so crackling good stories that have become some of the world's most durable and, mm. uh, and famous stories. But for many people, you know, these stories really are, though, uh, Trump are like a bag of beads without a string, right? They're just kind of isolated stories. Mm. Yeah. And um, so I'm wondering if you could take a few minutes. Um, to, to kind of give us the cliff notes version yeah, of, yeah. you know, or an elevator speech. Let's say it's a long elevator, right? Yeah, yeah. You've, got, you've got four or five minutes and somebody says, you know, oh, so you teach Old Testament. Um, I've heard about that. What, what, what's what's the Old Testament about? How would you how would you yeah. how would you tell that story? Well, I mean, one way I tell the story is by looking at the uh redemptive history that it presents, um, beginning with the creation stories in Genesis 1 and 2, which tells us that God created everything, including human beings, though in my opinion, it doesn't tell us how he did it, but it tells us that he created us and that at the beginning of the story of humans created in the image of God who are given the status of image bearers, that uh, they're morally innocent, which is a, something that we would not know apart from Genesis 1 and 2. I mean, our experience of ourselves and other human beings is that we're sinners, right? Um, but divine revelation is there to tell us we're not sinners because God made us that way. That's actually a Babylonian uh, creation story where mm -hmm. the... Uh, Human beings are created from the clay of the earth and the blood of a demon god. But um, but then Genesis 3 tells us that uh, because of human rebellion, we are sinners. And because, of, because we're sinners, our relationship with not only creation and with ourselves, but with God is fractured. 
But then the stories from Genesis 3 to Genesis 11 tell us that even though we're sinners, God stays passionately interested in, in pursuing reconciliation with us. So the stories in Genesis uh, 3 to 11, while talking about human sin and divine judgment, also give uh, evidence of tokens of grace, of God's continued involvement with us, whether it's the clothes given to Adam and Eve, or the mark on Cain, or the fact that Noah and his family survived the flood. Uh, there's no token of grace in the Tower of Babel story, but it's setting up the call of Abraham, mm -hmm. where uh, God says, you know, uh, go to the place I will show you, and then promises to give him blessings, which include not only blessing on his descendants, but also, also through them on all the nations of the world. And so um, the story of the Old Testament continues as the people of God become a nation, uh, Israel, in the book of Exodus, whom God saves from Egyptian bondage. And, um, and God continues to pursue relationship with Israel and through Israel, the nations in spite of the people of God's continued sin. So, I mean, we could talk about the various periods of time of the rest of the Old Testament where you have, um, after the Exodus wilderness wandering and conquest, you have a period of the United Monarchy, very brief time under uh, Saul, David, and Solomon. But because of Solomon's sin, the split between the Northern Empire and the Southern Empire, Southern Kingdom. And then uh, because of continued sin, the exile, but also the restoration. And um, so the narrative parts of the Old Testament uh, take us from creation all the way to the post-exilic period. And then, of course, we have the prophets, whom I often refer to as uh, God's covenant lawyers, you know, that, mm -hmm. that because Israel, and that's another way of thinking about the Old Testament, that you have this uh, developing covenantal relationship with God that, um, that looks forward to the new covenant in, that Jesus establishes but that the prophets come when Israel violates that covenant relationship. So, so um, there's so many ways that we could talk about how the Old Testament sets up the New Testament, and um, including the wisdom literature, which is one of my specialties, mm. that um, uh, books like, well, Psalms, and Proverbs, uh, Job, and Ecclesiastes, all of them imparting important teaching about who God is, who we are, the Psalms giving us a vocabulary of prayer to approach God at any season of our life, uh, helping us express whatever emotion that we feel toward God, as Calvin said, it's an anatomy of our soul uh, and a mirror of our soul. And, um, and so much more. I mean, the Old Testament is just filled with all kinds of riches. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was, uh, I'm, I'm recalling uh, one of the sessions that I um, watched where you were talking about Abraham and um, talking about the fact that that story just drags on and on, right? Um, <laughs> God yeah. promises to... Um, give him land and then ultimately give him a son and out of that son will come a great nation. But then all of this other, you know, drama and morass take place. And it isn't till like, you know, the last fourth or so of, of Abraham's life that, that God finally comes through mm. and, and gives him a son. Um, so, I mean, can you, I had somebody ask me this 
why why does this story drag on mm. for so long? Not just the story <laughs> of Abraham, but you know the the painful story of the kings. You know, good king, bad king, bad king, mm. bad king, mm. good king. You know, in okay, we get it, we get it. We, you know, <laughs> but but there, there's a reason for this, right? I mean, yeah. um, talk talk to us about you know the the drama of the Old Testament and 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 why we're given this robust story in so many different permutations and in so many genres. We'll talk, we'll talk about genres more in a minute. Okay. Yeah. So let's take the Abraham story. Um, and you're exactly right. It does drag on and on and, uh, and follows what I would call the journey of Abraham's faith or lack thereof. So you get a whole bunch of episodes um, that tell us how does Abraham respond to threats and obstacles to the fulfillment of the promises, particularly the promise of a descendant, which, you know, is delayed until Abraham's 100 years old. And often Abraham responds with a lack of faith and tries to manufacture an heir using his own human resources, whether it's adopting his household servant, Eleazar of Damascus in Genesis 15, or taking on a uh, concubine, uh, secondary wife, Hagar, and having Ishmael. And so I think not only is this charting what we might call the history of redemption, it's also kind of informing our own journey of faith, right? Um, and calling us to respond to uh, what appear to us as obstacles or threats to the fulfillment of promises that God gives us with faith, but also telling us in essence that God's not going to just abandon us if we doubt him or we falter in our journey of faith. And yeah, I've been actually uh, for another, for the present book project I'm working on now, I've been writing a lot recently about Genesis 22 and uh, how uh, a difficult passage that is in and of itself for sure. But the one thing that um, is is clear to me if you do a, a sensitive close reading of the text is it it's really talking about how at the end of his life Abraham does come to a firm kind of affirmation of confidence in God mm. it's a difficult text to be sure but that I think is um, uh, important teaching of Genesis 22 so, um, so yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there's some, some people say, well, you should not read the Old Testament or any narrative portion and say, go thou and do likewise, or go thou and don't do likewise. I actually disagree with that. I think mm. we need to, of course, pay close attention to the Old Testament as redemptive history that points to Christ. That's really important. But also, I think we can learn important lessons about our own Christian life, as long as we pay attention to issues of what I would call continuity and discontinuity between the Old and New Testaments. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes you read a story about offering sacrifices and you go, yeah, well, I'm not going to offer sacrifices because Jesus is the once and for all sacrifice. Or if you read about Joshua's warfare, you can't justify, say, modern nation warfare based on Joshua because that was, Israel is different than the United States. And uh, indeed that's maybe one of the major kind of hermeneutical errors today when it comes to something like Christian nationalism that they don't understand continuity and discontinuity mm -hmm. between the Old and New Testaments. Yeah. That's good. Hey, listen, I uh, I want to remind you uh, that are uh, watching us live that if you have uh, questions, uh, 
please feel free to uh, to enter them, and we'll um, try to get to them at the uh, the end the end of our talk. So, Tremper, um, let's talk um, let's talk Turkey about people who really um, genuinely would like to like the, the Old Testament. Um, but they're struggling. And yeah. we like to talk about some some keys uh, to reading the Old Testament. And I actually pulled out a couple of yeah. things that you've mentioned, and, and maybe you can comment on some of those and then obviously, you know, add your add your own to this. But I've heard you in multiple talks uh, uh, reference a quote that says the Bible was written for us. <laughs> But uh, but not to us. Did that begin with John Walton? I don't yeah. know who. who well, he's. Okay. I heard it from John. I don't know whether he heard it from somebody else. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, John and I have written a couple of books together, and uh, so I do want to attribute that pithy statement to John. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so here here's the question then: um, How do we then, mm. you know? read um, through the eyes of an Israelite, let's yeah. say that lived yeah. 2000 or 2,500 years ago. And, and this, this Testament with them was written to them, right? Yeah. Pr yeah. Primarily. And, you know, how would they have read it? And, you know, would, would they, for example, when they read the creation story, would there be a debate amongst them about whether you know the earth was created in six literal days? Yeah. What what what? Uh, how how do we how do we walk in the shoes in yeah. the sense of people yeah. and begin to read the scriptures through you know the eyes of a twenty five hundred year old <laughs> Israelite? Yeah, yeah. It, that's a good question, Paul, and um, and. Um, it's not easy, especially for, you know, non-professional readers of the Old Testament who don't study ancient Near Eastern literature, say, um, or ancient Hebrew in relationship to other ancient languages to get. But I think it's really important for everybody to take that as kind of a starting point. Um, and to uh, and and it gets easier the more you read the Old Testament, and also there are a lot of um, helps out there that people like John Walton and me and John Golden Gay and many other writers on the Old Testament. Good study Bibles will help you. But one of the first questions you should ask of any book that you're reading is, when was that book written? And, and some of them we don't know precisely when or with certainty, but some we do, you know, like we know, for instance, that Samuel Kings was written or at least came into its final form during the exile. Hmm. And so, and Chronicles came into uh, its final form in the post-exilic period. And that helps, for instance, explain why Samuel Kings has such a negative portrayal or emphasizes and selects negative stories about Israel and Judah because it's trying to explain to its contemporary audience why they're in exile. Or that, um, or and Chronicles of the post exilic period isn't interested in that question, but interested in other questions like what's our connection with the past? And uh, that's why you have so many genealogies, for instance. So, um, but the, but the most maybe connected to that, the most important thing to remember is um, that we know the culmination of the story in Jesus in a way that the original audience didn't. And so we can, what I encourage is what I call a two reading strategy of the Old Testament. The first one is to do your best to read it within the context of the Old Testament time period, at least broadly conceived. And then secondly, to read it in the light of, of the New Testament. 
and particularly in the light of Christ coming and his crucifixion and resurrection. So, um, so I think Christians ought to adopt a kind of two reading strategy. Yeah, that's good. Um, that that might actually be kind of a foreign concept, I think, <laughs> to people who read the Bible. Like, hey, <laughs> reading is reading, right? Yeah, what's, right. What's this about a reading strategy? Um, <laughs> but I, I think even anybody today, you know, even contemporary writers, you know, who are talking about how to read well and so forth yeah. would say that there actually is. There, there, we, we need to have some built-in strategies um, for for how we read. And one of those um, would be a, a recognition of, of literary genres. Yeah, absolutely. And um, and the Old Testament has many, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And yeah. In, in some ways, there's kind of a... Um, a hidden agreement, if you will, between an author uh, or a committee or however these things came about that <laughs> said, we're going to do this in poetic form or we're going to do this yeah, in law right. code, that the reader would read accordingly. And yes. if they don't, all bets are off, right? In right. terms of right. of what they're what they're going to come up with. So, talk talk a little bit about these these uh, literary genres and what we need to know about them, and just you know a little bit about strategic reading. Yeah, actually, I was <laughs> I'm writing a chapter on literary uh, approaches to biblical interpretation mm. for a future book edited by Danny Carroll and. Uh, I was writing on Song of Songs. I was writing on genre today and Song of Songs, using it as my example, makes a world of difference whether you identify the Song of Songs as love poetry of some sort or as an allegory of the relationship between God and his people as has been, as was very uh, popular during the, Middle Ages, early church and Middle Ages. So, so when you read the opening lines, the Song of Songs, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth for your love is better than wine. Oh, king, let's run. The king has brought me into his bedroom. Is that a, a woman who's expressing a desire for intimacy with a man? Or is it a reference to the exodus from Egypt as the Targum, uh, Jewish Targum says, where uh, Israel, who's the woman, is asking to be brought into the man that is God's bedroom, which is none other than the promised land. So that's an extreme example of how um, genre triggers reading strategy. So it's it's really important to understand the type of uh, book you're reading, it, because for one thing, it helps you understand the truth claims that that book is making. So uh, I was just lecturing last week at Regent College in Vancouver, a uh, course on the book of Proverbs. And, you know, if, if you treat Proverbs as something other than a proverb, it'll get you in trouble because on two counts, uh, for one thing, a proverb is not always true in every situation. A proverb is only true when applied in the right time, as is clear from Proverbs 26, 4 and 5. You know, answer full according to his folly, or he'll be or he'll be wise in his own eyes. Don't answer full according to his folly. Uh, you know, so which one do you do? Well, it depends on the circumstance. They're not making universal truth claims. And Proverbs don't make promises. Proverbs whether it's Hebrew or English or Chinese or whatever, it's telling you the best route to a desired conclusion, all other things being equal. They're not making promises or guarantees. Yeah. So if you don't understand what the genre is and how that genre works, you're going to get yourself in a lot of trouble. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, you know, this, this is not just, you know, like theological, you know, you know, airy fairy, you know, existential. I mean, this 
How, how many people have read the Proverbs as something other than wisdom literature? I, I think you said they read they read Proverbs as promises. And how yeah. many parents have been tormented yeah. Yeah. by, you know, bring up your child in the yeah. way they should go. And so clearly this is God's promise. Yeah. And yeah. since since I have a 18 year old, you know, who um, is out experiencing, you know, a different alternative to their Christian faith, then that's a clear indication that I've failed. Yeah. Yeah. That's and of course, the Job's three friends and even Job himself will read uh, wisdom in that kind of retribution way. I mean, right. Three friends look at Job and say, you're, you're suffering, you must be a sinner. Uh, Job himself thinks that if he's godly and righteous, he should be fine. Uh, so, But he knows he's innocent, so he accuses God of injustice. Why? Because I shouldn't be suffering because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, um, I am godly. I do fear God. I am righteous. I've yeah. done nothing to deserve this. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, we're gonna we're gonna move on here quickly here, but I, I would like you to talk just briefly about the prophets, because what they're like a third, right, of yeah. the of the yeah. Old Testament, and and actually, if I got this right, that the the prophets, well, well, Hebrew poetry, Hebrew poetry is what about two thirds or so of, of the Bible? Uh, is is that is that accurate? I think it's more like a third. I think it's, but that's still a lot. Who's that's quibbling a lot. over a third, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's still a lot. Yeah. So um, I, here, here's, this is a bit of a ringer of a question, but you're involved in Bible translation work and actually the making of Bibles then we would yeah. say, but can, can you talk a little bit about then the challenge of understanding Hebrew poetry um, in a double column Bible? Hmm. That that wasn't in the questions. That's no, I, no, I that, threw that one yeah. in. No, yeah. I mean, um, well, I I think uh, a scholar, well known scholar, particularly since he just published the complete his complete translation of the Hebrew Bible, Robert Alder, uh, put it this way: Every culture and every time period tell their stories and write their poems in different ways. So. Uh, that means it's really important for uh, readers, particularly professional readers like pastors and academics, to understand the conventions and of poetry and narrative. And one of the uh, one of the main features of Hebrew poetry, which is really obvious because of the two column nature of the way we format poetry is that poetry says a lot using a minimum of words. It's terse, it's brief. And in the Hebrew, it's even more brief than in the English because typically if there are three words in Hebrew, it'll be translated in six in English for various reasons. Um, so it's really terse, which means there's a lot of meaning in just a few words, which is telling the reader, triggering a read, reader strategy. It is slow down, ponder, reflect, don't skim, think about this. And then of course in poetry, there's a lot of what we call parallelism where within a poetic line, there'll be some echoing uh, it looks as if on the surface, it's saying, sometimes saying the same thing twice, only using different words, but it's not. It's always the second part of the poetic line is always carrying forward, progressing in some way, maybe sharpening, intensifying, emphasizing the thought in the first part of the poetic line which is another reason to kind of slow down and reflect. And then of course, poetry as a heightened and intensified use of figurative language like metaphors and similes, the Lord, you know, um, um, the Lord is my shepherd. <laughs> um, 
you got to sit there, you got to stop and think as you read through the poem, in what way is God like a shepherd? Because he's not like a shepherd in every way to me. And, and also, by the way, that's a good example of you got to read it in its original context, because one of the interesting things about the shepherd metaphor is that in the ancient world, it's also a royal metaphor mm. um, that today we just think in terms of it's a pastoral image. But but no, in the ancient world, kings called themselves the shepherds of their people. Uh, certainly David was both a literal shepherd and the shepherd of his people. Uh, Ezekiel 24, 34 talks about the shepherds of Israel, but also broader ancient Near Eastern literature, the King Sargon of the Assyrians, he said, I'm the shepherd of the black headed people by which mm. he got black hair. Sure. So, so that's an example of, of reading it in its original ancient context. It actually brings out the kind of royal, a royal perspective presented yeah. by 23. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's good. And, um, you know, speaking, speaking personally, even as somebody who has been in some form of Christian ministry for a long time, early on in my upbringing, which was in a, a really very fundamentalist south of the Mason Dixon line, you know, we were always reading poetry and, um, or excuse me, the prophets, um, mm -hmm. you know, looking for contemporary Oh yeah, um, right. You know, right. the, a nation right. coming from the north, you know, clearly was not Babylon. It was yeah. Russia, right? right? And right. the nation yeah. from the east, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, as 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 we learn to read it within its context, um, it, it's really stunning literature. And I think it was Tim Mackey at the Bible Project that says, you know, the the prophets were, I think he called them literary ninjas. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, that's good. <laughs> so it's it's so good. Hey, last question, and then we do have a few questions that people have have written in, uh, and, and I think you've touched on this a little bit. But but how do we apply the Old Testament, and is that even really the right question? <laughs> is, yeah. is application or is implication better? How how would you describe that? I I'm comfortable with application or thinking about contemporary significance of these. Uh, you know, of these Old Testament texts. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, you know, I'm one of the editors of, I'm one of the editors of the NIV application commentary series where we have a original meaning and contemporary significance section and a bridging the horizon section. But also I'm the general editor of the New Story of God commentary series where we have an explain the text in its original setting and then the live the text. What kind of implications does this text have for our lives today as Christians in the 21st century? And uh, yeah, no, I think um, uh, application in that regard is uh, uh a really important feature. You got to keep some things in mind when you do that, though. Again, continuity and discontinuity, um, and um, and you know, not everything is applicable in exactly the same way uh, to us today that it was in the ancient time. But sometimes it is. You got to think through the issue. See how the New Testament appropriates the Old Testament. Yeah, that's good. Hey, uh, I want to be sensitive to our time, and and we have people that are are sending in some questions, and I want to I want to move to those. Sure. Um, let's start with with uh, Are there any resources that you would recommend as like a crash course on ancient near ancient near Eastern myth and 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 literature? And I think you know you you cover that. Um, in in the video video series that like the book of Genesis, you know, in the creation yeah. story, that didn't come into a vacuous world. It came in where there were competing um, creation yeah. stories. So is is there is there a primer? Is there something out there 
or some things yeah. out there that that we could reference? I, there, there are a few things I could mention. One is a book uh, written by Kent, Kenton Sparks. I forget the exact title of it. It was published by Hendrickson. It may be published by Baker now, but it you look up Kenton Sparks, um, you'll see that he goes genre by genre in terms of ancient Near Eastern texts, uh, discussions of ancient Near Eastern texts that are relevant to various types of Old Testament texts. Then there's uh, John, our friend John Walton edited, uh, among other things, a commentary series, a five volume commentary, which is called the Zondervan Illustrated Bible Backgrounds Commentary. I did Proverbs in there that, and in these commentaries, they specifically refer to ancient Near Eastern backgrounds. Um, then there, um, you know, there are also really good English translations of the relevant text. One was edited by my own Dr. Fatter at uh, Yale, W.W. Hallow, called The Context of Scripture. And way back when, I even translated two or three Akkadian texts to be included in that volume. But, uh, and then, of course, the classic collection of ancient Near Eastern texts is called Ancient Near Eastern Texts, edited by James Pritchard. Yeah, there are a lot of resources out there. And also, a good, com good commentaries on biblical books will include some discussion of the most relevant text. So that story of God commentary series, which I did Genesis in, not only do we have explained the story, lived the story, but there's a section that talks about ancient Near Eastern and also previous biblical texts that inform that particular text we're writing on. Okay, that's good. Um, I've, I've got a couple uh, here, and I'm going to kind of combine two of them, I think. Um, one one uh, is, is how about taking a historical view versus a literalist view, and mm -hmm. I don't know for sure what is behind the question there. Is it uh, maybe that history and the way history was recorded in the ancient world was maybe different than history oh. from the New York Times or something like <laughs> that. But uh, let's start with that one. Well, um, I would say this, that uh, Genesis through Esther are all what I would call historical narrative and more particularly theological history in that it's telling a history related to uh but with a focus on god's relationship with his people so theological in that way it's not a political history it's not a military history it's not a legal history it's a theological history now within genesis through esther um history may be presented in different ways so I write a lot about how Genesis 1 to 11 is giving history, but it's giving a figurative description of history. So if this uh, question is related to, say, Genesis 1 to 11, I would say a literalistic reading as if you're getting kind of a transcript of God's actions in how he created the world and human beings as if he literally picked up dust and breathed on it as if he actually had lungs or that that the six days of creation are are making the claim that God literally created everything in six 24-hour days whereas the early church fathers like Augustine and Origen pointed out that hey, it's pretty obvious that this is not a literal description since you don't even have a sun and moon and stars until the fourth day. So how can you have evenings and mornings? So there are all kinds of signals in Genesis 1 to 11 that, yeah, it's talking about things that God actually did, like create everything, 
It's talking about humans who actually did rebel against God, but it's not giving kind of a literal description of those events. So, um, so the question's a really good one. It would be, but it's also it's also important. Maybe uh, one other comment to make, uh, which is the Bible's not interested in what we might call an objective brute fact presentation of history. Mm. Mm. Not interested in just the facts, ma'am, as the old detective web and dragnet used to say. <laughs> Uh, no, it's giving a heavily interpreted account of history. It's giving, um, and and that's true in relationship to, we have the Syrian annals that will talk about, well, King such and so fought a battle in year three. Um, no, um, the Bible is giving a theological account of history. Now, the reason why that shouldn't bother us is because we believe that that theological account is giving a correct interpretation of history. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not simply a, a brute fact history. It's a heavily interpreted history. That's good. Okay. I, I'm going to, I'm going to do one more and it's a, it's a difficult question and not surprising that somebody has has written this and i know that there are whole books being written on this but um trumper we'd like to hear mm -hmm. what you have to say and and it's relevant because the you know the youtube atheists um keep coming back to this yeah. this whole yeah. topic about the uh you know the the conquest so the question is yeah. what is your understanding of what exactly the israelites are being instructed to do in the conquest how would the fairness or justice of the instructions have been understood by those in the uh, ancient near east culture yeah uh, great question again and uh a difficult one, one that we all struggle with, at least in 21st century West. I think uh, it's interesting. I've worked on this uh, topic since 1980. I think I wrote mm. my first article on this. And most recently in my book, Confronting Old Testament Controversies, Pressing Questions on evolution, violence, history, and sexuality. I address it at great detail. And I mention that because we only have a couple of minutes left, right, Paul? <laughs> so, right. so what do I, I understand, I do understand that the instructions that God gives through Moses in Deuteronomy 20 is for um, the conquest of the Canaanites and that that doesn't mean that Israel tracked down every Canaanite to kill them. Uh, there are plenty, lots of evidence, more evidence than mo most people realize of Canaanites who came over to the Israelite side, not just the Gibeonites, not just Rahab. Mm -hmm. But we have an awful lot of mention of foreigners who join Israel later. Um, but, but, uh, but in the old context of the Old Testament, um, the conquest is seen as an act of judgment against the Canaanites, Genesis 15, I think it's verse 16, you know, where God says to Abraham, you will inherit, you will have this land, but not, not yet because the sin of the Amorites is not yet full. So, um, one thing I would say is that I think it's right, though my very good friend Pete Enns, who's coming up this weekend to hang out for a couple of days, uh, he uh, and my former student colleague, uh, he he uh, chafes a little bit at this explanation, but I think it's exactly right to say that what we have at the conquest is a preview of the final judgment, and um, and. And indeed, again, too, I think there's one area where if you have a trouble with the book of Joshua, you'll probably have trouble with the book of Revelation as well. And I would also, I wish I had it in front of me. There's a wonderful quote, and I quote him in my book, 
confronting Old Testament controversies by Miroslav Volf, who, um, you know, grew up in what used to be Yugoslavia with all the horrible genocide there. And his own, uh, he, he states very eloquently, more eloquently than I can paraphrase here, he said, I came to realize that I couldn't worship a God who is not a God of judgment, that a God of love has to also be a God of judgment. Mm. Well, wow. there's a lot more there, and I don't want to give the impression of a pat answer because it is a difficult issue, and I do talk about it uh, much more in the book, uh, Confronting Old Testament Controversies. Yeah. That that was uh, an excellent summation. Thank you. In the brief period that uh, that we had, and so um, I want to be conscious of of our time, and I think we're going to wrap that up. There are several unanswered questions, but thank you to everybody who submitted a question, and thank you to everybody uh, who came out on a on a Tuesday evening to deal with this topic. I mean, one of the things that we've learned at the Institute for Bible Reading, as we've done research, that there's a fair amount of shame that people have for not having read the First Testament. I've got actually shame for not having read the, the Bible at all and just dipping in and, and uh, getting, you know, fragments here and there. But especially of, of, the, uh, of the Old Testament and the people that have gotten mired down in Leviticus and, and Deuteronomy and so forth. So a good ongoing conversation for us. And uh, Tremper, thank you for, for being with us tonight. I'm just going to remind uh, you before we shut down, and Tremper, I'm going to give you the last word here in just a minute, um, that um, that we are giving away a one-year subscription to, uh, to Seminary Now. And that if you will share this on your Facebook post um, within 24 hours, we'll choose a winner and not only the, the one-year subscription, but also a copy of um, Trumper's book on the, on the Old Testament. And, and do please uh, check out um, Seminary Now. It's a fabulous site and a, a, a wide array of authors and topics. And uh, you can go to the Seminary Now um, website and um, sign up for a seven-day uh, free trial. So, Kremper, uh, give us the last word. <laughs> well, the last word is thank you, Paul, and thank you, everyone who came out tonight. And just reiterate uh, your sentiment that you shouldn't feel shame if you haven't been reading the Old Testament, but this is a good time to really dive in deep. And even though I won't tell you it will be easy every step of the way, it will definitely enrich your Christian life. Yeah. And I, I, I'll give a last word on top of your word. Find somebody to do it with, mm -hmm. you know, find somebody that will read with you. Settle on a settle on a reading plan, settle on a good reading Bible, and um, um, let, let the Bible be what it is, a communal transformation book. Amen. Amen.